The following is a Brother Asks and Building Better Builders video education series production. And welcome back to episode seven of the series that we're doing on logical fallacies with Nick Adair out of Palma, Alaska. Nick, it's good that you can join us again this evening. I see that you are in your lodge. I see the background and I remember that from my visit up there about two or three years ago. Yes, uh, since uh, everybody's maintaining some social distance, it's a very, uh, very empty place. So I've got plenty of room or plenty of area here to do what I need to do. Awesome. Well, I'm glad that you can join us this evening to uh, continue the, with the series. And uh, we're going to go right into it. So if you can get your PowerPoint up and running, we'll go into uh, the logical fallacy, I believe number 15, the appeal to emotion. That's exactly right. That is the very first one, um, is the appeal to emotion. Um, let me throw up uh, some information here. Uh, appeals to emotion include appeals to fear, envy, hatred, pity, guilt, and all sorts of other things. Though their valid and reasoned argument may sometimes have an emotional aspect, one has to be careful that emotion doesn't obscure or replace reason. So manipulating an emotional response in place of a valid or compelling argument is an is an appeal to emotion. And one of the best ways to describe that is somebody looking right at you and saying, well, what do you feel about that? Or how do you feel about that? Uh, have you an example that you can uh, show up on screen here? I do. <clears throat> Luke didn't want to eat his sheep's brains with chopped liver and Brussels sprouts. That sounds yummy. But his father told him to think about the poor starving children in third world countries who weren't fortunate enough to eat or have any food at all. So there's a, a targeting the kid with guilt because he's got something that some other kid doesn't have and therefore. Guilt is probably the primary um, emotion that is placed on the, the appeal to emotion. Um, a lot of times it's it really is just how you feel. I, I would say kids use it um, as a form of peer pressure. Come on, you want to go have fun, don't you? That's an appeal to emotion. I uh, I remember a recent uh, exchange on on line of obviously where an individual uh, was arguing his case, losing ground, and immediately threw the following statement up: "Have you no compassion?" And I was kind of thrown by it, not so much because I, I didn't question my own compassion. It's just that it came out of left field. Why would that be put forth unless the individual actually felt they were losing ground in the conversation? Well, this is a, this is a prime example of Mr. Spock. He never let emotion mess up his logical argument. If somebody were to say, Mr. Spock, don't you have, any? Well, I think Bones probably did. Don't you have any compassion? Spock would say, compassion has nothing, nothing to do with this, doctor. It's a simple fact. And these are the fallacies of logical thinking. These are not supposed to be emotion driven. And yet if somebody started bringing emotion into the discourse, uh, particularly as a leveraging point to sway the other party into agreement and or uh, at least having what is being put forth reconsidered, would that be an appeal to emotion? I suppose it can be if that's what the discussion or argument is about. Um, an emotional argument isn't always invalid. If you have a, a husband and a wife trying to reconcile differences, that can be very emotional and the emotions can be very valid, especially to the argument. But when we're talking about, you know, Luke not wanting to eat his sheep's brains because they're starving kids in other countries, that doesn't have anything to do with, I, I don't know, I don't think I'd want to eat it either. <laughs> Although I've never had sheep's brains. Uh, let's not go there. <laughs> so probably not too bad, though. The, uh, but, uh, yeah, the, the, the validity of the argument um, the, in this particular case, it's, it's a logical statement. I don't want to eat the dinner. And then the 
I guess the father brings up something that doesn't have anything to do with the argument to try to appeal to his emotion that he should feel bad for these kids. So he should feel lucky to have the food in front of him that he does. So the child's truth is they don't want to eat. And the father tries to change the truth by appealing to his, his guilt reflex, like, well, you have food that no one else has, so therefore. Exactly. You got it. Great. Well, and uh, that, that's 15. What, what is 16? Number 16 is the one that I cannot pronounce. It is two quo q, two quo q um, uh, in the Latin. Uh, this one's a little bit hard to get, so uh, it's easier referred to as an appeal to hypocrisy. So yeah, I'm, I'm still trying to figure out the pronunciation, I would say, to QQ. <laughs> it's, it's tough. It literally translates as U2, and this fallacy is commonly employed as an effective red herring. This is the, the red herring that we've talked about because it takes the heat off of the accused having to defend themselves and shifts the focus back on the accuser. So avoiding uh, having to engage with criticism by turning it back on the accuser, answering criticism with criticism. So to Kukwe is basically responding to criticism by criticizing the criticizer. Yes, that, that's exactly why we call it appealing to hypocrisy because you are using the same argument that the accuser uses right back at the accuser. Here's a prime example. Nicole identified that Hannah had committed a logical fallacy, but instead of addressing the substance of her claim, Hannah accused Nicole of committing a fallacy earlier in the conversation. So basically Hannah is telling the, or, Nicole identified that Hannah made a mistake, and then she's using the fact that Hannah made a mistake to attack Hannah um, in the same way that Nicole had made a mistake earlier. So when, when an individual points something out and the response from the other person is, is to go ahead and point something out also, they're doing the two quoque. Yeah, um, and again, this is one that you see in the news quite a, quite a bit, especially in political debates. The person on one side says, um, we just did this, and the person on the other side says, well, we would never do that. We would instead do what you just did. And it, sometimes you have to really closely listen to it, but it, it's accusing the opposite person of the exact same thing you just did. And turn them into the, or turn that person into the accused, as opposed so, from being. So is, is this more along the lines of doing the exact criticism back, or is it any criticism back to derail the conversation to a bunch of accusations that have nothing to do with the actual uh, argument? It, it's using the, the same criticism back, but it, like I'm, like I'm saying, the uh, um, appeal to hypocrisy. If somebody's being a hypocrite, basically accusing somebody else of something they've done, they've already done themselves. You're, and you use that exact same argument to accuse them. It's, it's the same thing on both sides. It's almost like a never-ending circle. So I, I can't turn around and say to you, well, you, you mispronounce that word. And you turn around and say, well, I don't like your mother. It, you know, that, that's not the same thing as me calling you a hypocrite. And, well, you, and you turn around and say, well, you're a hypocrite also because in order for this particular fallacy to be exhibited, the same criticism has to be given back for the criticism provided. Yeah, it, in the terms of pronouncing to quote, <laughs> to quoque. To quoque. Uh, in terms of pronouncing that, if I said, you know, I, and I call it two QQ, and some, <laughs> and then you turned around and said, look, I don't even know why we're why we're listening to this guy. He can't even pronounce two QQ, and you pronounce it the exact same way I said it, which is mispronunciation. You're basically accusing me of the same thing that you're doing. The appeal that, to hypocrisy. And, and that 
winds up with the circular back and forth where you're no longer talking about the thing, the truth that is being argued, you're now attacking each other. Absolutely. And, and the attacks may not be invalid. They may very well be justified in the sense that, yes, they are being, uh, if I call you a hypocrite and you turn me around and call me a hypocrite, well, we may very well be hypocrites, but it has nothing to do with the argument and the truth that you're being, uh, you're, you're seeking. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I could see where that would get into a vicious circle of, of either one-upmanship or just basically stalling the argument and, and derailing the entire conversation. Yeah, and the, the word hypocrite is used dramatically in the news media. You, that's probably one of the identifiers. You hear the word hypocrite, look for that type of argument because it's coming. Gotcha. All right. Well, thank you. How, how about number 17? Number 17 is the burden of proof. Um, now this one is not necessarily, this one gets confused with being a, a logical fallacy and actually being something that needs to be done. Sometimes you do need to have proof in order to, to assert your point or to get your point across. But the burden of proof is where we pull somebody in that, that is not necessarily available. So, uh, the, bur the burden of proof lies with someone who is making a claim and not upon anyone else to disprove. The inability or disinclination to disprove a claim does not make it valid. However, we must always go by the best available evidence. So saying that the burden of proof uh, lies not with the person making the claim, but with someone else to disprove. Uh, an, an example of this would be, let's just jump right to it. Bertrand declares that a teapot is at this very moment in orbit around the sun between the Earth and Mars, and that because no one can prove him wrong, his claim is therefore valid. There's no way to prove that there's a teapot around the sun right now. There could be, but, but there's no way to prove it. But that doesn't validate your argument. This is almost uh, like, a, like what I would call a blank statement. And this this speaks nothing to the uh, the dolphins that have left, saying thanks and so long and thanks for all the fish. <laughs> so, so long and thanks for all the fish. Um, they may have been the ones that left the teapot up there. I don't know. They that, that did seem to be a theme of that book was getting a cup of tea. <clears throat> it's true. Um, so the burden of proof. Uh, is often thrown up as a logical fallacy uh, as a way of arguing that a declaration is being made and there's no proof of the declaration or it is where somebody actually does have proof and the person who's denying that truth that that proof has to provide proof that it, it, it can be denied which, which is it? it? It's the person that it, the burden of proof is on the accuser, I think is how that specific works or specific statement works from uh, Plato. But uh, I think American terminology is the burden of the burden of proof is uh, on the state, <laughs> depending on if this is a, a legal drama or not. Um, yeah, a lot of times somebody will make a statement about something in an argument but they don't have any way to prove it or back it up right there. And just because it's, it's a statement that can't be proven doesn't mean that it's right or wrong. It could be true, it could be false, but there's no way to prove it at that point. And there's the burden of proof is, it's a tough one. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking from what it is that I've read is that somebody makes a claim and it's up to the other party to disprove it? It's not supposed to be up to the other party to disprove it. It's supposed to be up to the person making the claim to prove it. So if I turn around and say there is a teapot circulating in an orbit, mm -hmm. and you have to prove me wrong. Um, Technically, no. You have to prove that there's a teapot circling, circling the orbit. If you're the one that makes the original statement, you're the one that has to prove it. You're but the, the logical, 
but oh, the logical ahead. fallacy is that I'm putting it, I'm making the claim, and then I'm turning around and saying, you prove it. You prove me, you prove that what I'm saying is wrong. And if you can't prove that what I'm saying is wrong, I've run my I've won the argument and I've spoken a truth. And and that's the fallacy, yes. Okay. Um, no, you're you're absolutely correct. The and I'm this is probably a hot button topic right now, but I'm gonna bring this up anyway. The okay, let me brace the biggest, myself. <laughs> <laughs> the biggest burden of proof argument that I hear in the news currently or in the media currently is when somebody accuses somebody else of being a racist. Oh, you really, you had to go for the R word, didn't you? That, yes. I unfortunately, I unfortunately did. Because when that word is thrown out, um, that is quite literally a burden of proof uh, argument. The person says it, so it's out there and everybody heard it. And now the person who it is, who is being accused all of a sudden feels like they have to defend that statement. They have to come up with proof that they're not a racist, even though the person who said it is throwing out an argument that can't be proven one way or another. So the logical fallacy in this particular case is that the, the claim is made and now the target of the claim feels that they have to go out of their way to prove that the claim is false and the burden of proof is now on the target and the logical fallacy that a lot of people wind up engaging in is that they look to the target rather than the individual who instigated the claim to begin with. Yes, the, insti the individual that instigated the claim could be making a false claim. So it's up to that individual to prove it. Although, unfortunately, our media doesn't work that way. And I will add that that is one of maybe about two dozen things that I have seen happen with one person accusing another and everybody getting on to that bandwagon um, <laughs> and, and following through with the burden of proof being put on the shoulders of the accused. And they're actually the victim here. They are being victimized by the accusation. And yet the logical fallacy that people buy into is that they themselves have to prove it falls. So they look to the target rather than the accuser. Absolutely. And what we should be doing is looking to the accuser to see if he actually has the proof to back up his claim. Well, thank you, Brother Nick. And <laughs> although that was a hot button, it really did uh, drive home the point that the burden of proof is often put on the, the target where they have to prove their innocence and they really shouldn't have to. The accused should be the one providing all proof to back up their claim. Um, yes. Well, uh, before we go further into that, let's go ahead and uh, put a capstone on this. Do you have a preview of the, the next three that you can share with us before we close this out? Um, I do. Uh, the, ne the next one is, a, is an entertaining one called No True Scotsman. The one after that is called the Texas Sharpshooter. And the very last one in this series is going to be the Fallacy Fallacy. So these last three are, are kind of fun. I'm really looking forward to our next, uh, our next uh, interview and presentation. And of course, oh, it looks like you've got a few more beyond that too. So it, it we, I do not... have more than, than 20. Um, that we we can we can continue on and do more. Well, let's uh, let's do the next three uh, next time on episode eight. And uh, at this particular point, let's go ahead and close it out. You've been listening to a brother ask and a building better builders Masonic education presentation uh, live with uh, your coach host John Nagy and our guest speaker Nick Adair, covering logical fallacies. Uh, until our next presentation, uh, be well and travel light. You've been watching A Brother Asks and Building Better Builders video education series production.